It's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, to see several old friends in the audience, people I've worked with for, uh, oh, more than a decade, even going back to the ISTAD days. Priscilla, I first met you at uh, the World Food Sovereignty Forum in Rome, I think, when you were working with Olivier Deschuter, who, of course, is one of the, the co-chairs now of this group of international panel of experts on sustainable food systems. Um, it's also a real pleasure just to get to see your center and uh, to learn more about what you're doing. So I'm looking forward to spending the rest of the day with you. The thing that I wanted to talk about with you is something that has been on my mind for quite some time. Um, and I will show you and describe a combination of brutally simplistic theories of change and I would say brutally incomprehensible theories of change. Uh, the things that come out of um, social science, social theory, that maybe are a little more complicated than they actually need to be. But I really want to focus on what people who are working on the ground actually think that we're doing as we go out there and try to work on food system reform. This whole question about how we make a difference has just obsessed people in the United States ever since the election. I am seeing so much in the news now, every day, about whether you should call your senators or write your senators, whether it makes any difference to sign a petition, uh, whether you should go out and march in the streets, or whether you can be a kind of armchair activist and actually accomplish something. So I think the, the Trump election has really brought to the fore a question that's been dormant for a long time among American activists. I would not say that the United States is a very activist country. It's not a place where people are very comfortable going out and marching in the streets. But suddenly we're beginning to see that and we're also beginning to see people questioning, how can I make a difference in the world? This questioning is starting to filter over into food systems as well, not just politically, how can we get rid of this guy or get rid of the, the really atrocious cabinet members that he's trying to bring in who are rolling back legislation, rolling back human rights, doing everything they can to um, push the United States backwards in time. Uh, and that's very ominous. I'm sure that topic will come up later on during the day, but let's focus for now on food systems. Let me say first, this question of whether it really is neoliberalism that we're looking at now, I think that's under, under question. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what we've got because some of the elements of what we're seeing with the Trump administration and these other um, Marine Le Pen and these other um, movements toward nationalism that we're seeing around the world, they are not lining up behind some of the, the traditional tenets of neoliberalism, like free trade. Uh, we see Trump trying to roll back some of the trade agreements, the TTP, TTIP, those are off the table now. So what is this thing that we're facing, this beast? It might be a variant of neoliberalism, it might be uh, corporatism, it might be neoliberalism combined with plutocracy, uh, it might be fascism. Many people are, are sounding that ominous bell that that's what we're looking at in the United States, the beginnings of, of fascism. Sheldon Bolin, who some of you may be familiar with, is that a, a familiar name to anyone? He has a theory that he calls inverted totalitarianism, which is quite interesting to explain what's happening politically now in the world. Inverted totalitarianism, just briefly, looks not at um, a single authoritarian figure, but a whole group of corporations that basically function in an authoritarian way to take away control from the populace. And the populace are complicit in that loss of control because the corporations are giving us things like iPads and iPhones and 
things that we've come to believe we can't do without. Uh, Sheldon Bolan, I, I recommend him. He's a very interesting character if you're looking for explanations to yourself of what's going on. That's W-O-L-I-N. Um, in the food system, power still seems to be consolidating in what's called the corporate regime. If you go back to Phil McMichael and Harriet Fried Friedman's work on regime change in food systems, I'd say we're still pretty solidly in the corporate regime. Um, agribusiness is certainly alarmed by a few of Trump's executive orders that are threatening trade relations and upsetting the apple cart in various ways, but I, I think they're confident that he's on their side, and especially given the person who's being brought in as the Department of Agriculture, the head of the Department of Agriculture, who has a, a solid base in agribusiness, they believe that the Trump administration will be good for agribusiness. I don't think it will be good for farmers, and I draw a very sharp line between agribusiness interests and farmers' interests. So let's stick with neoliberalism for a little while and look at the neoliberal tenets and consequences in the food system that alternative food initiatives, and, and I hope that term is clear, I mean initiatives that are aiming at greater environmental quality, social equity, uh, economic sustainability, fairness. Uh, what, what are the tenets that are being challenged? by these food system alternatives. Oh, I forgot my, my slide. I, I, I figured coming from the United States, the least I could do is uh, talk about making something great again. And this picture, does anybody recognize it from it? It's, it's from Peppetry. It's from your Peppetry Telegraph. That's uh, obviously one of your local hobbies around here, raising <laughs> monster vegetables. <laughs> So the first tenet that I want to address is that economic growth is the highest good for society. Uh, the consequences of this, well, it, it, it might be obvious from what you, I'm sure, know already about neoliberalism, why people believe this, but the, the basic rationale is that economic growth provides benefits to all in the most efficient way possible. Although it's very interesting in this corporate age, and Trump just embodies the, the business interest, you don't even hear that rationale anymore. That for businesses to flourish actually has a public good rationale. All that we're hearing now is that it's good for business and good to have a billionaire in the, in the White House because he knows business and knows how to, how to make businesses thrive. But this, the original rationale was that uh, economic growth will provide benefits for the public good. And because of this, the private sector needs to be deregulated, taxes need to be cut, so that there are no restrictions out there on making profits. That's supposed to be a, a huge incentive, which I think is quite insulting to people, uh, thinking that that's the only thing that would, would make them work. Uh, but also there should be minimal interference with the flow of goods, services, and capital, not labor. Uh, the good services and capital. Free trade, according to classic neoliberalism, will benefit everyone because every nation can use its comparative advantage to produce the things that it produces best and import what it doesn't supply or doesn't provide very well to its own people. So that's the basic thinking behind that. And as we see this rolling out in the food system, the consequences have included the commodification of food and nature to be nothing more than inputs for profit making. They have no value in and of themselves. There's been a distancing of production from consumption. It's not important for production and consumption to be together if under this idea of comparative advantage, it's fine if you're importing your apples from New Zealand or Chile or wherever. Uh, this is morphing into global supply networks. We're seeing an externalization of costs to increase profit making, uh, and this results in low wages, poor working conditions, and rising inequity between people who are working in the food system, uh, especially at those minimum wage jobs, and the people who are the profit makers, so the CEOs of agribusiness. And finally, financial speculation, speculation the whole financialization of the food chain 
which has led to the destabilization of food prices, most dramatically uh, 2008 to 2009 in this recent food price crisis, although they're still tremendously volatile. Um, so the second tenet is that the market, rather than public policies, and this sort of follows from the first tenet, but the market should be governing economic interactions between people and between countries. And some of the consequences that follow from that tenet are that public services, including food production, uh, remember, we actually have a right to food, but public services, including food production, processing, market should be privatized because the private sector supposedly is more efficient at providing goods and services to the public than um, just having any, any schmo out there uh, growing food or um, getting water for free. I mean, honestly, that's losing profits. The public good and community, another consequence, are concepts without any value in this economic world. Some of you may be familiar with uh, contingency theory, which looks at different worlds of value. And in this harsh economic world, really, money is the only thing that has value. Everything else that makes life worth living to, I think, everyone in this room, really is discounted. It, it's not worth uh, creating conditions that are conducive to the growth and flourishing of those other conditions, like community. Um, public good and community should be replaced by attention to individual responsibility and individual choice. Uh, the social safety net and indeed the entire public sector can be dismantled since the market supposedly is going to care for all. Decision making should be decent, de should be centralized and controlled by the private sector. Therefore, rolling back regulations that interfere with profit making is a very good thing and should proceed as quickly as possible, which is exactly what we're seeing in the United States with bills already on the floor of Congress to completely dismantle the Environmental Protection Agency and roll back regulations as rapidly as possible. Now, to anybody who's really thinking about it uh, and not just interested in profiting from all this, there are immense contradictions in this. Uh, the market obviously has not been caring for all. We wouldn't have so many people who are hungry, even in wealthy industrialized countries, if the market were truly caring for everyone. But the consequences of a firm belief in this tenet of the, the overall um, primacy of the market it keeps rolling on, even if the pub public rationale for it has been swept under the rug. So, how are food systems <coughs> responding? How have they been responding to these tenants that have been before us for a few decades now? In the United States, at least since the Reagan era, that's when we started hearing these things around 1980. I would say in the United States, we're mainly seeing small and experimental steps. And some people might um, uh, say, no, 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 these are, are much more important than they seem. But we're seeing direct marketing, which seems to successfully connect some pre producers and some consumers. There's a lot of talk about community, for instance, in community farms, uh, community food security, community-supported agriculture, community-based feeding programs, Although exactly what community means in each of these contexts is, is a little bit vague. Uh, people really aren't in agreement on that. We're seeing some new business models that seem to be doing quite well in some places, things like food co-ops or collective farms. We're seeing food policy councils that sometimes establish more democratic and inclusive decision-making mechanisms at local levels or even state levels. Um, we're even seeing economic, social, and cultural rights being included sometimes in state food plans and strategies. And all of this is something that Brian Galt, who works at UC Davis, calls the rise of subversive and interstitial spaces. I love that phrase. 
Uh, but it really is interstitial. It's not mainstream yet. I would say it's easy but dangerous to just dismiss these steps, even though I said they're small, and I can document that they're small. Even though they are small, and individually they have little impact, they can make a big difference to the people who are working in them. They can be quite inspiring, engaging, they can help provide food to some people in dignified ways that don't require them to be dependent on charity. So I think they, they are still significant. Globally, the steps are more significant. We see things like fair trade that is challenging free trade and providing better returns, at least sometimes, to producers. We're seeing food sovereignty, challenging free trade, working for local self-reliance, and for women's rights, fighting industrialized agricultural practices, and setting up more democratic, localized governance mechanisms. Agroecology, as you folks know very well, is on the rise in recognition and practice. Lots of examples. I probably don't even need to pull these out for this audience. But uh, EFAS Food, the group that I work with, just published a report called From, Un From Uniformity to Diversity that talks about the shift from industrialized agriculture to uh, <coughs> diversified agroecological practices. And unlike the ISTAD, which was squelched, this new report has gotten a lot of publicity. It's been very heartening. You can get it, by the way, if you just go to www.ipes-food.org. You can download a copy. France? is saying they're all for agroecology, although what they claim to be agroecology is not necessarily what we would uh, agree is the full range of agroecology. We're seeing other states, Brazil, India, that have taken up agroecology. And as, as you folks exemplify beautifully, more researchers and more research that's tackling the, the very interesting questions that agroecology brings. So my question is, what is needed to actually be successful in these kinds of changes that now are quite modest and small? And I'd like to turn uh, to these contrasting theories of change that I have observed over the last 20 years or so, really, in my professional life among people who consider themselves to be food system activists. The first one, and it, it might be a little bit uh, uh, questionable to say these are activists, but people like um, Jason Clay, who's the Vice President for Business Activities at World Wildlife Fund, believes thoroughly in this, that what we need to do to be successful for food system change is to focus on the big companies, Unilever, Kraft, Coca-Cola, and move them incrementally down this line toward greater sustainability. And what he says, and his argument is somewhat, uh, it, it's hard to discount it entirely, what he says is that we will have far more effects, far more benefits to more people if we can slide these huge companies incrementally toward greater sustainability, then if we take these little, little people who are already trying to use sustainable practices and push them into, say, um, uh, organic 3.0, this new stage of organic agriculture. So that's the first one. And Jason Clay is partnering up with people like Walmart and these other big corporations to try to push this kind of change because that's what he believes in. A second one, and these first ones that I'm going to show are what I would say are very much change rooted in market-based solutions. This second one is called Vote With Your Board. May be familiar to some of you. Michael Pollan first uh, introduced this idea that we get to vote three times a day for a better food system. That all you need to do is go out and buy more organic food and suddenly organic food will be appearing in your marketplace. And there'll be more and more and it'll take over the world. Now, 
The Kellogg Foundation was really sold on this. And this is their theory of change that they introduced when they decided that they wanted to push the U.S. food system from 2% organic, which was a wild guess. They really didn't know what the baseline was. But they wanted to push it from 2% to 10%. And the basic idea behind this, this theory of change that the Kellogg Foundation introduced but then uh, quietly retracted because they got a lot of pushback from activists. The idea is that as demand at the individual and institutional level rises, this obviously means you've got a lot more, they were calling it healthy, fresh, local foods. You have a lot more of this purchased, and because it's being purchased, stores have an incentive to make it more attractive. The supply goes up because stores are looking for it. Uh, the product is attractive to consumers whether they're individuals or institutions, and this becomes a reinforcing loop where demand, consumer demand is driving it. And they had a few other things that would, would help this, effective policy incentives that would come about because the public wanted organic food so much and innovations that would be popping up in the food system that would make it easier and easier for uh, community-based food systems and corporations to fill this demand, and I think there's one more loop here. Uh, innovations are also helping uh, to connect consumers who have this overwhelming demand for organic food to find the places they can buy. I would say that this theory of change has not been borne out. And I'll show you my first diagram that's a little bit on the complicated side. But let me try to explain it. I was one of the people who really wasn't happy with the Kellogg Foundation's uh, theory of change here. And what I've been working on, and I'd love to talk to people more about it later, is a more complete systems view of the food system that includes more of those pressures and counter pressures that are pushing the food system into business as usual, that are keeping us stuck here. Organic demand has been rising, but as it's risen, corporations have basically captured it. And instead of small-scale farmers benefiting, it's huge farms that are meeting the, the technical requirements to be organic, but aren't fully organic in spirit. So you can't see all of the little, little labels on this, but this whole bottom part of the diagram, what's in black, is the business side of the food system. And this in the center is the market share of business as usual, businesses including farms, versus the market share of pro-sustainable businesses and farms. So this fluctuates, you get one or the other. And that's a little bit simplistic, but as business share for market share for business as usual goes down, or, or let's say as market share for pro-sustainable goes up, then, then the market share for business as usual goes down. But where we are right now is that the market share for business as usual is pretty high. And what they do with their profits, this little box is profits, is that they engage in several scurrilous practices. <coughs> uh, one thing they do is they invest heavily in lobbying. And through lobbying, they are putting people in office and passing legislation that is not in the public interest. So these purple things have to do with, with legislation. So they are pushing for legislation that doesn't benefit us, like removing the Environmental Protection Agency, they're in, um, investing in campaign finance, getting people in place who will support them instead of the public interest. They're investing in uh, swaying public opinion um, in a huge way through advertising. And if advertising is really high for business as usual companies, then citizen engagement in trying to promote sustainable food systems goes down. So as this rises, the market share of business as usual, we see a lot of these other things shrinking away. 
the way the diagram is drawn is kind of the other way of, of what happens when market share goes up. But these heavy black lines are some of the main ways that business as usual is maintaining its hold on the food system. I left out reinvestment in their own business and I left out media. But those are, of course, other ways that they're influencing public opinion. Through media, they are reinforcing this cultural value, which is kind of a linchpin. The cultural value that it, it's the feed the world narrative. It's the idea that we have to have big corporations, big agribusiness, in order to get the foods we need, that there's no alternative. So as, as this cultural value of accepting agribusiness goes up, people are less likely to vote for policymakers that will support the public interest. They will be less likely to pass legislation in the public interest, which means, and there are actually more lines here which, which aren't showing up for you guys, but the sustainability of food system activities will go down and the impacts on the environment will go up. So, I'm trying to pack a lot into this diagram, as you can see. I tried to show that this idea of voting with your poor is ineffective, completely ineffective, because it's only touching a little bit of the food system. The only thing that it's doing, as people become aware of why they should vote with their poor, they become engaged but really only engaged in purchasing. They're not engaged politically. They're engaged in purchasing sustainable food in the marketplace, which means, okay, there's a little bit of a benefit, a little sustainability from food system activities, uh, and the impacts of unsustainable practices go down. But you've got this tiny little reinforcing loop, which was basically what was being shown on the Kellogg, Foundation's theory of change. That tiny little reinforcing loop that's going on at the same time that all of this stuff that I showed you in the previous slide is continuing unabated. The political pressure, all the ways that business as usual is skewing public opinion, uh, trying to inform people about benefits of GMOs, for instance, uh, continuing with the Feed the World narrative, continuing with um, national <coughs> legislation, all of that is going on at the same time. So people who think they're voting with their board are living in a tiny little bubble in the food system and ignoring all these other political processes and cultural processes that are continuing to push us into business as usual. Hope this makes sense. I, I see a few people nodding, so hopefully I haven't lost you completely. Um, so let me go to the next, and I call them notions because I don't think they're really theories of change. The next notion is that we can just tell stories, and this has become really uh, popular. Uh, this idea that inspiring stories will move the planet forward. There's an organization in the United States called Planet Forward, and their next conference is Story Fest 2017. And just look, you can win your own trip to the Brazilian rainforest if you enter your inspiring story that will inspire other people. Now again, this is looking at just part of the diagram. If we go back to this diagram, this is cultural values and beliefs, which are heavily influenced by stories. I definitely get it that we assemble meaning from the world through stories, but they're trying to just go straight to this and ignoring all this other stuff that's happening too. And you have to be addressing food system change on many different levels to be effective. So let's move on to the next notion. Um, this is what I would call, ooh, more inspiring stories, variants of Schumpeter's created destruction. Uh, those of you who have social science degrees have probably been steeped in Schumpeter's creative destruction, but this is uh, basically the idea of mutation, that, that businesses are going through this constant deconstruction, a mutation where ineffective businesses kind of drop out, 
they, they fall by the wayside, and then new ones are coming into play all the time. So the variants that we see of this idea in the food system are that we're going to create food system alternatives that move into the space that's vacated as neoliberalism, or the industrial food system, uh, in this case with food systems, collapses because of its own inherent lack of sustainability, its own internal contradictions. So that's one variant. A second variant is that we'll fill vacancies in these businesses as the CEOs and other proponents of neoliberalism die, so politically or business, we'll just kind of take over the ranks, these people who understand about alternative food systems and their value. And the third, idea is that somehow we're going to outcompete the mainstream by scaling up or linking in networks. So um, let me back up just a little bit before I go into the next one. I want to back up to the, the preconditions that are necessary for each of these four, oops, going the wrong way, for each of these four. The preconditions for Notion one is compelling reasons for corporations that control the mainstream food market now to change their behavior. They have to believe that they can actually make better profits if they shift. And some people will say, well, what's well, happening? But I would say it's happening at too slow a level. Um, the second one, these various market, other market initiatives, voting with your fork and these ideas that you can tell more inspiring stories that will get people to change, and variants of Schumpeter's creative destruction, require <coughs> alternative food systems that are so appealing and so functional that people voluntarily choose them instead of the mainstream alternatives. And I call all of this market choice because there's this underlying assumption of the importance of consumer choice and the belief that alternatives can function better than the mainstream at providing not only food, but good food for all. And I'm not sure that that's been proven yet. We could argue about that. But there are complex distribution systems that right now are bringing food all around the world and we have to do better than those, better than those distribution systems to get people to make this voluntary switch. Uh, Schumpeter's created destruction, by the way, this is a, a diagram, I'm not going to try to explain it, but this is Frank Gales, who's a Dutch researcher on transition theory, and he's basically talking about the same thing, that there's this area in the middle uh, it, and he's talking about transitions in socio-technical regimes. But there's this area in the middle of chaos, and then it reassembles either to uh, meet little niches in, um, in the food system, in, in our case, or by creating a whole new regime. And another theory is resilience theory that has a very similar idea, that any kind of system goes through this, this uh, pattern, a process in which capital builds up in the system, and then it, it kind of becomes dead and stagnant. And the system collapses somewhere out here. There's a release of a lot of energy and little components that get reassembled, reorganized into new systems. So that's basically behind resilience theory, too, this idea that this is going to happen. So let's move on to the next one that, that might be a little more appealing to many people here. This idea, this notion, is that we're going to participate in social movements that relentlessly struggle against the enemy, whoever that is, and consolidate with other movements until we're so large and so powerful that we can demand change from our governments. The precondition for this to work is sustained citizen participation 
in political action and the ability to deal with militarized states. So it requires a lot of sacrifice. Uh, there are people who have done this. Uh, MST, the Movimiento Sin Terra, is a great example of how they have actually achieved it. I'm not sure that people in the United States or other industrialized countries are ready for that kind of sustained political action. And then you could say this is kind of a, uh, another side or a complement to that idea of working with social movements is that we will simply demand that our government recognize human rights trump corporate rights. We will roll back legislation that has enabled corporations to amass unprecedented political power and hold elected officials accountable for regulating ways that the private sector violates our rights at home and abroad. Again, this requires informed, sustained, citizen participation in political action, and the willingness to fight for higher taxes as well, because taxes are what will provide the wherewithal to the government to do all this. They can't just do it on their own. So, a few quick statistics. How am I on time, Michelle? Am I running out? Okay. Good. Another, another 10 minutes. Okay, okay, we can manage that. Do current food systems embody any of these preconditions, is the question. And you can see that I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, first, that, that might actually be the last of my slides. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. But we'll leave it up because it's inspiring. That's a story that I can get inspired by. Um, in the United States, at least 96% of the food that's consumed comes through mainstream channels, Walmart primarily. Uh, other supermarkets, discount big box stores. This implies at least an acceptance of these channels as being okay. People are not boycotting them. Although some of the purchases are doubtless due to not being able to afford uh, to patronize alternatives that serve better quality food, like farmers markets and community supported agriculture. But in 2012, farms with direct sales to consumers were a little under 7% of the nation's 2.1 million farms, and those sales accounted for only 0.3% of total agricultural sales, 0.3% direct market. And three states, New York, California, Pennsylvania, accounted for more than a quarter of direct consumer sales. Second fact to label for you, ultra-processed foods, Right now, ultra-processed foods, as opposed to organic, healthy, fresh, local, they make up 58% of the current U.S. diet, and they account for 90% of added sugars in the U.S. diet. So people like this stuff. They're still buying it. Third point, the failure rate for these scaled-up options, remember that's one of the alternatives in the, the variant on Schumpeter, that these different options will just scale up and network together and then we'll take over the country. But the failure rate for scaled up options like food hubs and organic distribution networks is actually very high. It's been extremely difficult to keep those things afloat. Agribusiness, meanwhile, is flourishing. And they are moving into mega mergers, which I'm sure you know all about. Monsanto, Bayer, uh, Kim China, Syngenta, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. John Deere is coming in on this too. It's true that citizen action is increasing. People are concerned about divesting from fossil fuels, fighting for a, a higher minimum wage. They're concerned about racial equity, but it's still paltry compared to what it would <coughs> need to be to really push for the kinds of chain, changes that I'm talking about. The tradition of activism has been weakened in the United States with the destruction of unions. They have been completely undermined and by uh, media that's been bought out in such a way that they ignore citizen action or depict act, uh, activists as being dangerous anarchists who are out there vandalizing. And also undermined by an overworked population that has little time for anything other than making a living, and collective acceptance of convenience and comfort as the necessary trade-offs to good food for all. 
that the only way we're going to get convenience and comfort is by giving up good food for all, which is the old cheap food for cities policy that has been in play in the United States for quite some time. Um, domestic police are rapidly mil militarizing in the United States. They're able to squelch civil disobedience like the Occupy movement. Boy, they moved in fast. And talk about networks. City police were networked all over the country to figure out how to squelch these dangerous activists. Bills have been proposed to Congress recently to make nonviolent protest illegal uh, and to make it legal to run over protesters who are blocking roadways. This is the United States. Corporate money is flowing into elections because of recent legislative cha changes. Uh, much of it is <coughs> untraceable ways. Donations to U.S. 2016 campaigns from agribusiness totaled over $23 million, with 87% of that going to the Republican Party. And this revolving door between corporation and government, it's spinning away at a mad rate. Inequity continues to rise in the United States as well as globally, with only eight people now owning the same assets as the lowest 50% of the world population, according to Oxfam International. The wealth of the 1% richest people in the world is equal to 65 times that of the poorest half of the world. So inequity is at outrageous levels. In addition, inequity in access to education, which is the traditional route out of poverty, has risen dramatically. Rather than being a tool for social mobility, higher education now reinforces inequality with rich people able to go to those rich schools from which they get rich jobs. Um, restrictions on reproductive rights are going to exacerbate this problem with uh, access to education. On the positive side, some of the things that I mentioned earlier, some of the improvements for uh, working conditions and wages have been successful in the United States. Coalition of Democracy Workers is a great example of being very successful through being very strategic and keeping at it. Mainstream retailers are moving into this, this area of healthy, fresh, local. They understand that consumer demand has shifted. And, and your stores, a fellow who used to work with Loblaws, who's on Ipus Food, says British stores are 10 years ahead of United States stores. So your stores are showing some of the trends that we'll be seeing in 10 years, perhaps. And many food ma manufacturers are responding to concerns about obesity by changing their formulations so that their food is a little bit healthier. Um, evidence of the downsides of industrialized agriculture? Way up. Uh, that report that I mentioned from uh, Uniformity to Diversity, its positive reception is an example of that. It talks a lot about the downside of industrialized agriculture. Massive worldwide protests against Trump are another really good sign, I would say, even though con Congress so far has been ignoring these completely, just pretending as if they don't exist. Um, so all of these things might support the incremental change in the ma mainstream uh, theory of change. But in addition, we know that no modern society with the levels of inequity that we experience at present, at present has survived unchallenged, has survived at all. Going back to the French Revolution, you simply don't have those levels of inequity that go on and on and on. People will not tolerate it. At the global level, advocates for food sovereignty and the right to food have been successful in some international forums, like the Committee on World Food Security, uh, the premier forum for discussion of food issues. Uh, which has endorsed the right to food as a fundamental principle for any interventions that will improve food security. Peasant movements have successfully claimed land for food production. The right to food and food sovereignty are part of the Constitution in many countries now. And the right to food is part of the legally binding uh, or the soft law framework for other countries. Climate change, I would say, is the huge disruptor on the horizon, and that might change everything. The industrialized food system does not seem very well equipped to be resilient 
and adapted. These long supply chains that it depends on won't hold up with climate change and the kinds of dramatic weather events we see. So all of these phenomena lend support to the more radical theories of change, uh, moving on from the, the market-based alternatives into social movements and human rights as drivers. Okay. Um, the idea that food systems alternatives will become compelling, perhaps because they're the only systems that remain that are able to feed people because the industrialized system has collapsed. While we're waiting for it to collapse and while we're trying to decide what to do, I would suggest a kind of precautionary principle for alternative initiatives. Do no harm to the people or the planet. That goes with all of these different theories of change. Trying to fight neoliberal assumptions, structures, and mindsets has value, even if the initial impact seems small to the people who are engaged in this. They overcome paralysis and cynicism and keep people open to structural breakthroughs and those little wedge entry points where we could have more radical transformation of the food system. At the same time that we're holding out this precautionary principle, we need to maintain our sense of urgency. Climate change is rapidly making our planet uninhabitable. Social chaos and conservative backlash are very likely, and I think that's part of what, why we're seeing the conservative backlash in many countries. As climate change-related conflicts increase, as the numbers of climate refugees explode, as food production drops due to drought, floods, temperature extremes, all the things that we know will happen with climate change, and at sea level rise overwhelm cities. So again, if we can maintain that sense of urgency, I think that we will be well poised to move into these more radical theories of change and work with and support the social movements that in my belief have the best chance of creating a real cultural shift, a shift in the narrative of what people believe is possible and good. So thank you.